it's based on our love for God. And so for me, I guess that's what has to ultimately drive me. That's got to be at the very core, the engine, if you will, that drives the motor is, is that my relationship with God is I'm not doing this for, for a pay packet at the end of the fortnight. I'm not doing this for some kind of fame or glory, but because I've just talked to Jesus every day and, and he's given me what, what he's passionate about. And the more I look into his word, the more I look into his eyes, his face, if you will, the more that becomes a part of who I am. Welcome to the Hacka Podcast. My name is Greg Hackathorn. I hope you all are doing well. I just wanted to uh, share this with you real quick. On Saturday, it was announced that Sydney would go into an even stricter lockdown. Unfortunately, this directly affected where our church is located in the city and where our pastor lives. It went into effect at midnight, so around noon it was decided that we would pre-record two services for the following two Sundays. We were able to get a small team there by 4 p.m. and spent the next few hours recording. It was amazing seeing our team operate in faith under such abnormal circumstances. It is a testament to the leadership of our pastor. And that is why I'm very excited to share this conversation with you that I had recently with this great man in my life, Pastor Stan Harvey. I cannot tell you how much of an influence he has had on my family and my ministry over the years, and I'm sure you will enjoy getting to know him through this episode. Stan Harvey is the Senior Pastor of the Pentecostals of Sydney and currently serves as the Overseas Missions Director of the UPCA. He previously served as the Australian Home Missions Director as well. He is a powerful preacher who has ministered in countries all over the world. He's a leader's leader, and I've been blessed to serve under his ministry for the past 12 and a half years. I know you will be blessed by this conversation. Well, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Brother Greg. It is an honor to be uh, here on the Hacker Podcast, and I uh, appreciate the uh, the opportunity. <laughs> the opportunity. Oh, man. Well, <laughs> I'm just grateful that you uh, made time out of your day, out of your busy schedule. I know we're in a bit of a lockdown at the moment, but, I mean, uh, being a pastor of a, of a large church, uh, I'm grateful that you set time aside for this. Well, I am so, uh, so pleased and happy to see all of, a lot of our younger leaders like yourself, like younger preachers that are utilizing all the means and technology available to, to get the word out, particularly with this particular forum on podcasts is so popular nowadays. And I myself uh, listen to podcasts all the time. And so it's exciting to, to see uh, this one going ahead. Awesome. Yeah. I'm, as you know, I'm a big consumer of, of podcasts as well. Um, so I wanted you, I wanted uh, the listeners to get to know you a bit. Um, a lot of the listeners of the podcast would be members of your church or would know you. Um, but obviously there's more to the story than, than what's presented on a Sunday or, or what they may know uh, in casual conversation with you. So if you wouldn't mind giving us a bit of a background of uh, you growing up and, and what that was like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was born in the Philippines. Uh, my biological parents are obviously Filipino. Uh, back in the uh, in the 70s, I was born in, um, and uh, at a very young age, my parents uh, had separated even as a baby. Uh, I don't ever recall them being ever together, um, and at, at a certain age, I think I was about six years old, my mom remarried uh, my stepfather, uh, who was originally from Australia, was working in the Philippines and was working in the same company as my mom, and so they got together, they got married. And as a result, the, uh, her, her second husband adopted uh, my sister and I, and that's where we, we took on the name Harvey. It's a, a very Anglo name. It's not a very <laughs> Filipino name, um, but we immediately became Australian citizens. And uh, even though he was an Aussie, he's actually from Queensland. He's a Queenslander. Uh, oh, sorry after to hear the that. Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, although he doesn't have much fondness, fondness for Australia at all. He, he always spoke of Australia as he would never live here. Um, and he actually educated himself in the US uh, after the Vietnam War and was from the US for, for a long time working there. 
And so he was a bit like a Mel Gibson as a result mm. of his work. He was an Aussie with a, an American accent. And, um, and, and yeah, and he was, you know, preferred to live in, in Southeast Asia where we were for the most part of my upbringing. And then when I was about six or seven, we, we moved to, um, to Singapore and uh, we lived there and I grew up in, in a, going to school in an international school uh, that was um, dominated, I suppose, by a lot of Europeans and North Americans. And, and that became my community. I was part of the, what we would call an expatriate community. And so um, that's where I spent a lot of my formative years. And in that time growing up, um, my, my father, my stepfather, he was uh, having fought in the Vietnam War, it kind of messed him up psychologically. Mm. He had a, a lot of issues. He was a, a very big man, you know, over six foot four. And just very, very antisocial, very mean, uh, and so we were not allowed to to speak, uh, you know, our native tongue Tagalog, which is where I lost the use of it. Oh, wow. uh, we weren't allowed to eat Filipino food. We were raised um, very European in the way that uh, you know we were to to behave and everything. And so um, I lost that kind of connection with my culture. I, it wasn't mm -hmm. something that was ingrained. Even though my mother tried very hard to you know especially when she would would uh scold us and beat us you know she would be um cussing in the in in my native tongue <laughs> and that's all about what i could remember of the language at that stage because my my stepdad um was very very paranoid about you know us speaking behind his back or what have you mm -hmm. so um I, I lived i guess i grew up not really detached from my own native culture if you will and I became very European in the way that uh, I, I had to view life. And uh, yeah, and so we were there in Singapore for like six years, six, seven years. And then we moved, my, my father took a job elsewhere for another company and we moved to Sri Lanka, hmm. which is was of course back in, in the eighties, a very uh, troubled place. There was a civil war between the Sinhalese and the Tamil at the time. And um, he was, um, you know, it was a developing, uh, underdeveloped country at that stage. It was considered, and um, uh, it was a very difficult place for us to transition from a place like Singapore, a, a modern metro met metropolis, right. uh, cosmopolitan city, to a a very backward city where they didn't even have McDonald's there. Mm -hmm. And for uh, a thirteen year old, that was you know <laughs> very important. <laughs> uh, there was, I think, at that time, there was only one hamburger joint, and the the their hamburger patties were laced with curry. Oh. in in the in the meat and oh, which was man. horrible to me and so um there was one mall when there was nothing much in the mall it was like a, a very um you know very bare very sparse as far as things to do and things to buy particularly for teenagers and so it was quite depressing initially but once we got school started we started making friends started becoming a community there and that's where um and that's where you know we, we learned to live there for about two and a half almost three years and uh, I really enjoyed it. Actually, it's a beautiful country physically. It's you know one of the most gorgeous beaches that you will find, um, aside from obviously the, the the military violence that was taking place mm -hmm. around. Um, you know, it, it was a really really lovely place. And, and so when I was about sixteen, and I guess this is kind of taking me into to Australia, uh, just as I turned sixteen, uh, my sister was already was my my mom sent her to to Australia to live with my mom's brother here in Sydney, because um, at a young age, we were, because my father kept our, our home like a military camp. It was so, he was so strict. You know, he would come into to my bedroom every day and just kind of inspect my room. And and if, if my my clothes were not lined up properly in the wardrobe, they would end up on the floor, I had to redo it all again. Uh, he oh, would man. check my bed to make sure the crease, there was no creases on my bed sheets when I would do my bed. And this one time, I remember, I, I was so tired, I slept in. It was during the school holidays, mind you. Hmm. Oh, it was about 7 in the morning. I'd slept in, and he grabbed me. He grabbed the whole mattress with me on it, and he slammed me against the wall, you know. And so I, we lived in that kind of psychological sort of fear and oppression, uh, always, you know, looking out, making sure that we're doing things correctly because my, my father was such a dominant sort of person. Hmm. My mother tried her very best to temper him. Um, but it was obviously a volatile marriage as well. Financially, we were very, very well off. You know, um, we had we went to the most expensive schools in, in the cities in, in in the countries that we were living in, 
but but we lived in a it was a bit of a nightmare it, it was to me what i would find out later on would be considered psychological and emotional abuse wow. and so because we were in that state my sister and i were quite rebellious but but we had to do it you know uh, subversively uh you know and and so we would start clubbing going out clubbing we would sneak out at night even though you know i guess the rebellious part in us you know my sister was 16 i was about 15 at the time and i started very young age doing uh, alcohol drinking alcohol drugs smoke a cigarette started smoking at 13. and this was all and, in sri lanka uh, this was mainly all in sri lanka I actually started a little bit in singapore okay and, but it really came to a full sort of experience you know to in sri lanka mm. this one time my, my sister got caught by somebody saw her in a nightclub from one of my dad's friends and he told my dad and when my dad found out you know he he belted her and and my mom just went crazy she said no you cannot do that you cannot touch my daughter or whatever and so yeah, she sent her to australia 16 at that age i mean that's that's pretty full on yes it was pretty full on and i mean we you know we were sneaking out clubbing we weren't doing <laughs> yeah. the right thing necessarily but but what he did, you know, she might just, my, my mom would just would not stand for that. You know, mm -hmm. she, you know, oh, she could beat us, but not him. He's too big. <laughs> <laughs> my mom is like, you know, five foot nothing. So it was okay for her. You know, we were kind of blocking her shots <laughs> every time she tried to punch us. You know, this is back in the eighties. This is back when, uh, you know, it was acceptable to, to still beat your kids. Um, but what my, my, my dad did was probably over the, over the line. You know, it was a bit, uh, uh, it was obviously uh, considered abusive. And so my mom sent her away. And so when I was alone there at home with my dad, and uh, you know, we had we had servants, we had a driver, we had a cooking lady, a washing lady, a gardener. I mean, we had a big house, you know. But but it was still his his psychological problems was now being focused on me alone. And mm. and I got to a stage where I can't even remember what the incident was, but there was something in me that snapped. I just snapped, and I just stood up to him. And I'm like 15. And six, almost 16, I'm looking at him. He's six foot four, and I'm still about the same height as I am now, but a lot slimmer. You know, maybe I, I had, <laughs> I, I, was, I was trying to do sit ups. I'd be locked up in my room for two weeks when I'm grounded. I get grounded for uh, for sleeping in or, or for doing something, you know, wrong with school. I'd be ground. I would not literally see the light of day for two weeks. Wow. And so for two weeks, all I do, I do push ups in my room, I do uh, sit ups in my room, you know, just to try and keep from the boredom and fit. And, and so when, when this incident happened, I just remember, all I can remember is the emotion. I was enraged. I snapped and I said, come on, I challenge him to, to, to have a fight, you know, and I didn't know really how to fight. Um, you know, I had a, had a wooden sword there, <laughs> but that was all bad all. And I was so, I was so, so angry. I, I walked, my mom just trying to stop me. I was going to the kitchen to grab a knife and to stab him. And so uh, at that point, my mom knew I, I couldn't stay either. So she, she, she convinced my dad to send me to Australia. I was 16 years old to start. It was January to start my uh, year 10, doing year 10 here. And so I came here in 1989. And, um, and I've been here ever since. I've been in wow. Australia ever since. Almost it's, 30 years. Yeah, it's an amazing story. Um, living you know, all over the world uh, with, with someone like that. Um, what sort of interests did you have growing up? Yeah, I, I guess um, I, I, I'm, I'm a sports person. I always loved sports. I always did well in sports wherever I was. I, you know, in Singapore, I was playing soccer, and uh, and then in school, you know, I was doing I was doing actually cross country running. I was playing basketball, um, but my family sport is tennis. My um, my great grandfather, not my great grand, my grandfather, my mom's dad, actually. After World War II, he was he was ranked um, in in the top ten in the Philippines. Oh wow! Um, of course, back in those days, there weren't too many people playing, but all of my my mom, my aunts and uncles, and then while we were in Singapore, um, they all played tennis. And while we were in Singapore, my mother was a, was a full time housewife. Well, you know, we had a servant, and so she spent her days during the week playing tennis every day, and she was really good. She started playing a little bit of tournament. And then that's when I got into it, you know, at 12, 12 years old, maybe, maybe younger, maybe 10 years old, I started playing. My, my grandfather would come over to Singapore 
and he would take me out on the court and start, you know, teaching me. And then it was probably when I moved to Sri Lanka that um, there was nothing else to do there. <laughs> yeah. There was no cinemas to go watch movies. There was no shops to hang out in, you know. And so we, my life revolved around school and what we what's known now as the Colombo Swimming Club. The Colombo Swimming Club was where all the expats, uh, expatriates hung out, you know, all the um, British high commissioners, U.S. embassy workers, they all were there. All the kids and me and my my two mates, we 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 lived there. We swam, we played snooker, and they had two tennis courts there to which I, as much as I could, would play. Um, and so I became I I fell in love with the game, and I mm -hmm. became really good at it, you know. But uh, my parents really, they didn't, you know, were, they were too busy to to have me to be like a a sport sort of parent where they pushed me to to train every day. I yeah. had to find it all myself. I had to find a way to get to the club myself. I would ride as a as a four, 13, 14 year old on those uh, what they, we they, we call them tri shaws. They're like tuk tuks, and uh, I learned I learned how to bargain with the, the locals to get from my place because my my dad would refuse to to take me to uh, to get even the driver to take me to Colombo. The car was only for him, and if we were there with him, we would ride. But I had to find my own way. I would play before school, and then sometimes uh, and then after school, if if your time and money would permit. And the, the guys that would work there, um, the local Sri Lankan sort of uh, maintenance guy, he was also a tennis player. So I had to pay him. I paid him like five bucks to play with me for like an hour, <laughs> half an hour. And so uh, ever since then, and then when I came to Australia, I kind of dropped tennis. I, I never touched a racket for maybe 10 years. Oh, wow. I got you know involved in all kinds of stuff here. And then um, I, when, I, when I got saved, after I got saved, that's when I said, oh, I've got to start getting healthy I'm again. And I up. I picked it back up. And so I'm still playing today. Uh, the last couple of years, obviously, has been sporadic. I've had some some knee pain that, that I could probably from tennis, all the years of playing tennis. And uh, it's still a passion of mine. But um, aside from that, you know, I, I mean, I love sports in general. I love to watch. The, I keep up with the scores with the NBA, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, rugby league here in Sydney. Of course, I'm a, I'm a Roosters fan. And how I became a Roosters fan, I, I don't know. I just, I guess the first place I started hanging out with friends was in Bondi. Mm. And so I just adopted that. Even though I was living out west where uh, Penrith Panther should be, uh, every weekend I was in Bondi Junction because uh, that's where I had some friends that we had met in Sri Lanka and they were living out there and we would go clubbing and stuff in the city and we would stay at their place in Bondi. So, but yeah, sports is a big thing for me, but uh, and I have to try and curtail it and control it because <laughs> it could consume the hours of my day. Yeah. Uh, because any sport, even European sport, if it's soccer, yeah. you know, especially cricket, with, glo I'm a, uh, with global sport, I mean, there's just sport on all the time. All the time. If you're into, you know, like uh, Commonwealth nation sports, you know, like Australian, British sports, and U.S. sports, and we're in trouble, bro, because it's like <laughs> all year round. All year round. And and I became a, a bit of a cricket tragic from Sri Lanka. And, you know, Sri Lanka, mm, their main course, sport yeah. is cricket. And so if I didn't learn the language, then, you know, I wouldn't be able to get along with a lot of people there. So yeah. I, I, to this day, I still love cricket. Yeah, I mean, you have to adopt the sport. If you're, if you're a bloke moving somewhere, you have to adopt the sport. So, you know, exactly. I'm into rugby and cricket and all that because I want to be able to talk to uh, my friends about <laughs> something besides <Yeah>. church. <laughs> So obviously you weren't raised in church. Um, that's quite apparent by, by your background. Um, how was it that you came to the church? So when you first started attending the POS, you've only ever attended this church, but it wasn't the POS then. It was over in Belmore, Grace Tabernacle. How did you find yourself in Belmore? Yeah, I think, um, well, obviously uh, my, my mom, you know, when we were living in Singapore, Sri Lanka, she actually took us to the Catholic church every Sunday. She was quite consistent. She was very faithful in taking us to the Catholic church and all the years growing up, I, I still, you know, even going to church, I, I knew that there was a God, but I just didn't, didn't think he would be, you know, relevant and personal. And the, the questions were just so overwhelming about whether he was really, you know, who the, the God that they talked about in, in that church said he was. And, um, you know, having um, been there in, in the situation that I was in back in Sri Lanka when I was locked up, as it were, like a prison being grounded by my dad. I remember praying. I remember praying to God and saying, God, if you're real, please help me from this. This, this is not what a teenager should be living. I knew that. 
And so when I came to Australia at 16, then I was like a bird out of a cage. My parents were not there, having been sort of oppressed for so long and um, not having any freedom. I was literally, uh, I was virtually like a bird out of a cage. And my uncle, who was a very lovely man, a good man, couldn't control me as a 16 year old young man. I wanted to taste and, and see everything. Mm. And so I, I went sort of haywire in the world. I went, um, you know, drinking and doing drugs and got into the nightclub scene. I was into to dancing. Like we got into that. That was like, a, you know, back in those days, it was really popular, you know, the MC Hammer style, <laughs> um, you know, Bobby Brown called New Jack Swing, you know, the, the running man stuff. That was the stuff we were doing. And we, I made some money out of it. You know, we were doing shows. I was on a mu music video. I did wow. a Coke ad, which I don't know where it is. Um, but, but it was just, you know, it wasn't like a career I was pursuing. It was just more of a, a thing we enjoyed. And, and our whole purpose in life was to, 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 to get wasted from alcohol and drugs and, and to live an immoral life, you know, um, picking up girls. That, that was like a competition between the, the guys that we had, we're hanging out with. And, and so at 18, at the age of 18, 19, um, my brother-in-law, who is my brother-in-law now, he wasn't back then, but Brother Mo, uh, he started going to this, this church in Belmore. And, um, and you know, he, he started coming with his Bible, started sharing to us. And I remember the first time he came, you know, we were just so determined to, to get him out of this. You know, we were just sort of testing whether it was real. And we were just trying to, maybe we thought it was a cult, you know, get this guy out of this church. And so we, we somehow, we, we convinced him to, to, to party with us. And that night that he came with his Bible, I remember he was just gone. He was out of it and he was blood out and he lost the Bible. I think we, it, this, the Bible stayed in my house and this happened, I think oh two gosh. or three times, but the, this one other time, I think the third time that, that he came back and um, yeah, I was by myself and I was kind of, my defenses were, were gone as well. I, I, you know, I just, all I could do was listen. And, you know, if you know, Mo, he's a pretty, you know, kind of dominant personality. Oh, he's, a, just he's, talk a talker, yeah. he's a talker. And so I just sat and listened to him about him going off about this church. And he had just gotten baptized at the church. And he says, bro, you got to come with me. And, and and something in me was really convinced. And of course, I, at this stage, and, and I, I, this is something, this is my part of my story. My history is that I, I was, I was under the influence of, of a drug virtually every day. I was smoking cannabis virtually every day to the point that I was selling it from my house. Hmm. And um, I was getting quite depressed. I was getting really, really dark in my heart. And when he started sharing this to me, it's something in me started to come alive. And so some, he convinced me, I think it was like two days later, it was either Friday or Saturday, a day or two days later, we caught a train and he, he got me to come with him. We caught a train to, to Belmore. And, and there he had this other guy with him, his cousin, he was called his cousin then, but he, they're not really related, but Seb, but the Seb was with him. And the two of them sat me down on the train, giving me like a, 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 a simple 20 minute Bible study from the book of Acts, starting from Acts chapter two, and then going through all Acts, you know, uh, whatever, I can't even remember. But I remember <laughs> Acts, when I read Acts, and he said, see, this is what happened, you know, they were the Spirit of God moved, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they started speaking in tongues. And so we, we got off Belmore Station. We walked the long road on Burwood Road from Belmore Station. I go, it's a big uphill up to, to where the, the church was near, near the school, Belmore Boys. And as we round the corner, we went to this little, well, it looked like a house, really. Hmm. And I walked in there, and, and there was all these, these really tiny seats that were, were, were uh, you know, connected together. And the place was already full, but there was something in me. And I started getting really scared. I was scared. Because I've never been any to, to any place like it, and then um, they sat me in the front row, and all I can remember was just the people were going crazy, worship, dancing, but I could feel that there was something in this place, and I couldn't explain it. And and at the same time, in my mind was going through those scriptures that they had just showed me in Acts chapter two about getting the Holy Spirit, and so um, that was the first time I walked into the Belmore Church, and of course that first night uh, after the preaching, I came to the altar the appeal was made to come forward and and i don't know whether i volunteered or, or mo was just pushing me come on bro let's go you know what I, I i got on my knees and i started praying and god filled me with the spirit for the first time and i started speaking my mouth was just moving and i think i remember i was so desperate for something i was so desperate for, for something real for god 
mm. uh, that it literally only took me a few moments to to get the Holy Spirit. And and Mo, he'd been trying to get it for I think a couple of months. He'd been going to the church. He still didn't have it, and he didn't oh, have man. it. He didn't even get it that night. And he was like spewing. Yeah, I can and, imagine. Uh, yeah, but yeah, that that was the first time. That's awesome. So first time, first time at a Pentecostal church. I imagine your eyes were wide, <laughs> coming from a Catholic background. Yeah. And I, I, I'd mentioned that you weren't raised in church, and obviously I meant um, Pentecostal church because when you mentioned um, your mom taking a mass, I, uh, I think I saw uh, you showed me your church in Singapore, the one you used to attend, yes. I believe. Yeah. So yes. yeah, oh, that's awesome. That's a powerful testimony. And so you were, uh, you come to the Lord. You're you're born again. Um, when did you? You know, you started serving, attending the church there, being uh, part of the youth group, uh, growing in your walk with God. When did you feel the call to ministry? And and what I mean by that is not necessarily like a service ministry where, you know, the whole body is called to service ministry. <laughs> you don't get a pass <laughs> if you're in church. Yeah. Uh, you're called to serve. Uh, but I'm talking more like, you know, a preaching, uh, that type of ministry. When did you feel the call for that? Yeah, I, well, after that first night, I, I got the Holy Ghost. It literally changed me. And I think within a couple of weeks, the, the church, there was a, a youth camp that I attended. And that youth camp, um, Brother Rick Gonzalez was there. And I remember just how powerful his ministry was. I, you know, the gifts of the Spirit was operating miraculous, uh, things that I've never experienced before. And as, as powerful as it was, uh, to be honest with you, I, I still had so many issues, you know, from my upbringing and, and I had so many weaknesses. And then immediately or almost immediately, uh, I, I started a relationship with a girl that was not in church. And and um, sadly, after maybe about two months of trying to, to become a Christian, I, I left. I, I backslid. I, I just couldn't do it. And at that stage, I hadn't even been baptized. And so it, it was, um, you know, I had I just thought it was so hard. I just couldn't do it. And I was living a, a double life with this girl. We weren't not living a godly relationship. It was not a, a healthy Christian type of relationship. And so I found myself stopped. I stopped going to church and I went back to as what the scriptures would call the beggarly elements of the world. Back to, to the dog. The dog has gone back to its vomit, if you will. I was back doing drugs and stuff. But uh, and I was away. I didn't come back to church for maybe about a year. And in that year, I think I grew much worse than I was before. Uh, mm. I started, you know, hearing voices. I started um, becoming paranoid. And I think it was from all the drugs. And, and I, I was at a point where I, I was having a psychotic episode. And this is what made me come back to God was I thought I was going to die. At that point, I was losing my mind. I, my, my body was breaking down. I thought I couldn't breathe. And, and I don't know if whether it was my mind or it was just it was really happening. But my mind was so messed up with the drugs that um, the next day I, I rang again. I rang Mo my best friend. And I said, bro, are you still going? He was still going to church. I wasn't. And and he said, yeah, I'm still here. I said, right, look, I need to come to church. I need to get baptized. And so I, I came to church that Wednesday night. It was a Wednesday night. Brother Slack was preaching and they had just moved. They had just literally moved. It was like maybe a couple of months or, or weeks into the new building in KFC. Hmm. And I got baptized. And, um, and then um, I, from there, I, I decided that I need to be full on with God. I cannot live one foot in the world and one foot in church. I have to be, because I tried that and it didn't work. Yeah. And, and that's what they told me. They preached to me that you, you've got to be full on or not at all. And I remember hearing a message. I can't remember who the guest speaker was. It might've been uh, maybe brother, um, brother Wolfram or, uh, or somebody else. Anyway, he was, the message was, you know, you got to burn your bridges. In other words, once you cross your bridge, you you there's no you've got to burn the bridges so that there's no way you can cross back. Right. And so that for me was a turning point, uh, and uh, we had the first turning point that year <laughs> in in Camp C, and uh, and I think that was maybe the the message that was one of the messages preached at turning point uh, was that uh, you got to burn your bridges. And so from there, I I, I became full on. I just said I'm I'm cutting myself off from my worldly friends, and I'm just going to be full on in church. And um, and then just, I guess it's a long way to answer your question about feeling the call of God. Uh, I remember uh, when I started, I joined a connect group. It was led by um, Brother Sam and Sister Salah Bolivosa. 
and I actually moved in with them for a couple of years because my mom had divorced my, my father and now she was with another guy who is her current husband today, Brother Ray. Hmm. And, um, and they were living, they were together. They were not born again at that stage either. And I said, there's no room for me because his son's there and my sister's there. And so I had to find a place. And so I fully, I immersed myself completely with the community of the church. I knew if I'm going to survive. And I, at that stage, I still I thought I still had psychological problems from the effects of the drugs. Mm. And so at that stage, I said, I've got to give my all to this. And I remember my, one of my early uh, small groups, but the Sam asked me, he, he gave me a week to prepare. Can you read a scripture and share for 10 minutes? And I remember getting up and, and reading the scripture. I was so nervous. There was only like maybe eight people in the group. I was so scared. I was so nervous. When I read the text, I, I said maybe one sentence. And it literally lasted for a minute and a half. <laughs> and they were looking like, okay. And I was so nervous. Like my voice was shaking. You know, my knees were shaking. I said, and I sat down and I was like, oh man, that was pitiful. And, and so at that point, I never had any aspirations or thoughts that I could be called. You know, I just did it because they were asking me to do it. And then, um, then, you know, Brother Sam and, and Mo as well was, was started giving me some pointers about how to, how to share the word, how to read. And then the next time I did it, uh, it actually, I was a lot better. And then I think maybe a few times on, um, and, and I guess what I'm saying is I don't know the exact moment or I feel like God gave me an audible voice to tell me that he's called me to the ministry. I think it was a, a, one time when, when I shared and I saw that it was affecting people. Mm. People started crying. People started praying. And I said, man, you know, maybe, maybe this is what God wants me to do with my life. Right. Cause you know, I, I didn't know what I was, what, I was working in a warehouse. I was working in an office. I didn't know exactly what my career, I didn't have any particular ambition. I knew I had to get reeducated and, and try to further whatever career. But at some point when I, I, felt like God was using me. I felt like God was speaking to me about messages that I was giving. And when I gave those messages, something inside me was saying, this is, this is what you need to do. And then along the way, and it, maybe it was like a, a, a two week window, like three different people came to me and told me that um, they, they had a vision of me and, and all of them were, were similar that I was preaching, that I was ministering. And wow. so I guess it was at that that around that period of time, maybe a year into me being in church, that, that I felt the call of God. Mm. But I'll, I'll be honest with you, Brother Greg, um, I, I have to give credit where credit is due. I think it was the likes of, of Brother Sam Villavosa, who's passed away now, who, who basically told me, and he told us, a lot of us, you're going to be a preacher. Mm. And so I'm just like, okay. And, you know, I just, as a, as a young person, naive, not really knowing much, I just accepted that. And, and I think that's what, what kind of, for me, what discipleship was, was somebody telling me, this is what you're going to be. And, and he probably saw something in us that uh, he believed that we had that call of God. And, and, and that's why I try to emulate the same kind of approach when I see somebody that I feel, the young person, a young man, young woman, that I feel has a call of God in their life, that I will tell them, this is what I see. And so uh, I guess it was around after about a year of being in church that I felt this, this pull, this mm. compulsion to, to that this is what I need to give my life to, you know? Mm. And so, yeah. That, that's awesome. And yeah, it just goes to show you how important it is to have those people in your life that are going to speak into your life, but also small groups. Why small groups are, are so important because especially in a, in a, in a bigger church, it gives people that opportunity uh, to minister to a smaller group of people, build that confidence, and and see where God will take them. Because um, you didn't know that ultimately you'd be preaching at conferences and uh, pastoring at church and doing all these sorts of things when you're speaking at a small group. Um, but you just made yourself available, and you had a leader there that was willing to use you. That's awesome. Exactly. Yeah, I think, you know, I just sort of reiterate that, Brother brother Greg, I think small groups was, for us, it was like a microcosm of, of preparation, a microcosm of a greater calling. And, and if you can be faithful in, in I, I was leading for about two years, and this was really depressing. Uh, I, for two years, I, um, after, after being part of Brother Sam's small group, he asked me to lead my own group. 
and and for and 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 brother Mo and brother Jacob, they had their own small group, and and they had like they had a bunch of people. They mm. had like a group of like you know 15, ten to twenty to fifteen. They were in Campsy, and I had to I had to start a small group, and there was only me and one other person <laughs> for virtually two years. Oh man, I was so depressed. It was a Bible was study, at, bro. <laughs> I was looking at brother, and they they were growing, you know, and they had a bunch of young people. My 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 wife now was before we were married. She obviously her most sister was. They were a bunch of their their group that was going to that group, and I'm like looking at my group, me and this one other person, and it was like that for almost two years, and I, I just kept at it and kept at it. After about two years, we had a growth. Two people came, wow. then another, and then, by you know the next several years, I had an average of fifteen people in my group. And then we were having that at Bankstown. We moved, it was a, a Reesby, and then we moved to Bankstown. But yet, and I look back at it now, and it became my schooling for, for my ministry in the long term. And so um, I'm not discouraged with, with numbers. Obviously, you know, we use numbers to, to measure if there's something wrong, what we're doing wrong, what we're doing right. But um, for me, that was the, development, the developmental stage for me in, in developing for, for the future ministry. Yeah, being faithful. And, and, you know, no matter whether the success is there straight away or not, uh, I mean, I, I think that's an important lesson for for my generation and those younger is um, faithfulness is important. And just because you don't see results straight away doesn't mean you move on to something else or that it's a failure. Uh, you can continue to, to work and to strive and, and do the best that you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes God has you in that holding pattern. Hmm. And I'm thinking, God, I was praying, I was fasting, I was doing outreach. Um, but somehow, I, even though I was, there was only like two people for two years, um, I felt like I couldn't get out. I just felt like I had to keep at it. And, and God kept me there. And, and I'm glad, I'm glad I did. That's, that's awesome. Well, you were, um, before you became senior pastor at the Pentecost of Sydney, you were the youth pastor for a number of years. And, I've found ever since I've uh, been attending and part of the church, I found that you've always had an ability to connect with young people, whether that's in person or whether that's in ministry, um, you know, through, through your sermons. I just feel like even now you, you minister to the general body, but you still are able to stay connected with the younger generation and able to speak words um, that, that can challenge them and affect them. And, I was wondering, how is it that you are able to stay fresh and relevant after all these years? I know I'm not. I know you're still a young preacher uh, in the in the eyes of the, the general body, um, but so I'm not throwing any shade there. Um, <laughs> but how is it that you're able to stay fresh and relevant? I mean, you've been you've been ministering to youth and 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 then as the pastor for what 15, 20 years now. Yeah, I I think. I've always had a passion for youth ministry, probably maybe because part of it is my personality. You know, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm quite a young sort of personality. I love to, to, to be, you know, I guess youthful and joyful in the way that I approach, uh, you know, relationships and I like to have fun, but I guess part of it is also because I guess I was saved at a young, at a young age and, and because my teenage years were so tumultuous, you know, it was so, I mean, uh, I, I'm unfortunately sad to say that I, I got into crime when I was a, a teen because I was so lost. I was on the streets. I was on the streets for a little while, even though I had a home uh, because of the drugs. And and so when I look back as to how how lost I was as a young person throughout my adolescent period, uh, and that's when I got saved. And that's when God came in just in time. And I, and I, and I always look back to that and always think that's where the basis of who I am and my story is at that, that stage of when I was a young person and where God came in. And so possibly that's the reason why I have this ability to, I guess, connect and have this, you know, relevance to, to young people uh, with that. But I also believe, and, and I think that's how I stay, try to stay fresh and relevant is that um, most people will come to God at, at that youth age, you know, that period of adolescence. And, and of course, uh, studies show that adolescent goes adolescence goes all the way up through the age of 25, um, and so how you want to define that, whether physiologically or psychologically, but uh, I I sort of 
can attest to that, that even in my early 20s, I was still going through a whole heap of change. And I think that is also statistically, it shows that that's when people most come to know God is at that age. And, and once you get beyond that, it becomes a lot harder to convert people. And so that's, I guess, the basis of my, my approach to ministry. We've always been, as a church, Brother Slack has always emphasized evangelism, soul winning, discipleship. And that's been uh, the identity of our church, the Pentecostals of Sydney, you know, as long as I have been in church. And so that's um, why we have to always aim for uh, the, that younger generation and, and to stay relevant to them, find ways to communicate and connect with them and, and raising up young leaders. But as well, you know, having young leaders like yourself, Greg, uh, the other young ministers and leaders, our youth pastor, uh, the likes of Brother Greg, Brother Sam, uh, Brother Jared, um, all of these uh, young leaders that we have, I, I stay connected with you guys. Mm -hmm. And that, that keeps me informed. That keeps me somewhat relevant and, um, you know, and keeps me young as well. You know, we will we'll go to ball games together occasionally. We'll do stuff together. But, um, and, and, you know, I try to talk to them. I try to talk to young people. And I, I guess that connection of when I got saved, uh, and even as I am at the age that I am now, um, it, it helps me. It helps me to, to stay relevant that way. Hmm. And along that vein, um, if there is a uh, a young person, and again we're talking, you know, maybe thirty and under, but a young leader who feels the call to ministry, what sort of advice would you give uh, a young leader like that? Yeah, and that is um, something that we try to to uh, adhere to and try to really implement in our churches. Our, our way of operating is to encourage young people to to get involved in ministry and even if they don't see it in themselves like like my story was that that we would recognize that and and draw that out of them but i guess what i would say if, if a young person a young leader feels a call to ministry um, i would take them back to ecclesiastes 9 and 10 it says whatever your hands find to do do it with your might for there he says you know the writer says there's no work nor device no nor knowledge no wisdom in the grave wherever you, uh, where you're going to end up. So it says, you know, you, we don't know how long we have on this earth, but whatever we have available to us, and this is the same message that Brother Slack gave to me, but whatever your hands find to do, do with your might. Mm. So at this stage, if your hands cannot find the pulpit, where maybe some feel the call and some will, will find that calling there, but at this stage in their ministry, it's not right there right now. Well, what can your hands find to do? You've got to look for it. You've got to look for what you can do, whether it's leading a small group, teaching a Bible study, uh, helping in Sunday school, um, helping in the music team, wh whatever it is that's available to you. And you do it with everything that you have. Do it with all of your might, all of the talent and skill that God has given you. Um, and I'm convinced that when you do that, that your gift will make room for you because your gift has to develop. You know, you're, you're not, your hands are not strong enough to, to handle the pulpit, but your hands may be strong enough to handle a Bible study. Right. And, and while you're handling that Bible study, your hands are getting stronger. Mm. You're building up your muscles. And that's exactly how it worked for me was, you know, in our small group. And, and it, ours was a little bit different, Brother Greg. When we had a small group, it was in a little unit in, in Lakemba, and we had a pulpit. On a Saturday night, we had oh, a pulpit, wow. and we had to dress up in church. We had a shirt, tie, and suit. Oh man! And we had to have we had to have rows. The seats were put in rows. It was like mini church in this <laughs> little. Uh, I think Brother Slag would have had a heart attack if he saw it, but but it, we treated it like church, and and it was again part of our of our development. And so you have got to find whatever you're able to do. If the door shuts on you, shuts uh, to you, or about when it comes to. Uh, preaching in, in youth ministry or leading a connect group, but but yet the door's open for you uh, for Bob studies. Don't get frustrated with what's not open, but but whatever you can find, do it with everything that you have, and God will make room for you. That's right. It's so important that um, that in in the season while you're developing that you don't focus on where you want to go. It's important to have that in mind, right? If you feel the call. It's important to keep your calling in mind uh, through your day-to-day, -day, through your spiritual development, and, and so on. Um, but if you focus so much on that, you can miss so many opportunities 
that are there for you right now uh, to strengthen the body, to help the church, to be the best that you can be as a Christian right now, as a leader. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's that's the key to longevity as well, is if you focus too much on what's too far ahead. Now, we all have to have goals. We have to know where the finish line is. But and, and this is what how I learned to survive in cross-country running. You're a far more greater expert at running <laughs> than I am, Brother Greg. But I remember I was there was only two of us from our entire school that was um, that was asked to, to run the, the, the cross country. Me and another Aussie guy uh, in our international school back in Singapore, and we were competing against all the other international schools. And when I when I started running, I said, "Man, it is so far. I said, how am I going to survive?" And for me, the the way I learned to survive was just focusing on little incremental steps. If I could just get to there. And also focusing on my rhythm to make sure that what I'm doing, how I'm running my strides, uh, the, the pace, the tempo was something that's going to be sustainable because it was comfortable to do at that stage. I wasn't going to go full on and then die after about you know 500 meters. And so I think, right. yeah, whatever you can find to do right now, uh, you can do it comfortably in a sense. I mean, you're still doing it with, with everything that you have, but you're doing it in a comfortable sort of measure in a comfortable tempo that um, you can know is sustainable for your, your weekly routine, at least. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, when I first moved to Australia, uh, this would be um, end of 2008, beginning of 2009, uh, you and your wife were so kind to me. I remember uh, my first general conference, the 2009 general conference. Um, we had met a bit, but uh, you guys made time for me. And, and now that... Uh, now that I've been going to general conference for so long, it uh, it means more now <laughs> looking back. But you guys made time for for us to just to get to have a a, a, a night a dinner with Steph and I uh, at that first general conference, just you and Sister Robin. And you guys have always been so kind to me, welcomed me with open arms to the POS. Um, and um, I remember when you were voted in as the uh, senior pastor. This was in two thousand nine as well. Uh, you were quite young. Um, now, when I was there voting for you, I didn't feel you were young because I was, what was I, 21? And I think you were, mm-hmm. uh, oh no, I was 20. I was only 20. Uh, right. I believe you were around 36. So you're only a few years older then, um, than I am now. You had a young family. Um, you just had you just had your second child. He was only a few years old, Joaquin. Um, and then later you'd find, I don't know if you knew when you were elected as pastor, but you found out that he has, um, special needs. How have you been able to balance all of this? Because pa- pastoring by itself is very difficult. And then you throw into the mix, a young family. And then also now, um, your son, uh, who, who has, um, uh, special needs. How is it that you're able to balance all of this? Well, I think um, and that's a great question. And, um, you know, I, I guess just giving it a bit of context uh, to leading up to 2009, a couple of years before that, um, you know, I had been uh, for two years, uh, the assistant pastor along with Sister Gina uh, with a view to me becoming the senior pastor. And and be, what, what happened was leading up to that, we had a, a terrible situation in church. We had a church split and that was so horrible. That was so terrible. The experiences that we had, the the um, I never felt anything like that in all of my years in church. But everything that happened after that became easy, <laughs> you know, mm. um, because it was more like a baptism of fire. And then, of course, it you know, Brother Slack fortunately was still around, although he was he was incapacitated as far as his ability to minister and to lead. And so we were leading it for a couple of years. And then when 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 the vote. When I was finally elected in 2009, um, you know, I had already been in the groove. I'd already been in, created that rhythm, if you will, of, of ministry. And, and so I was able to, um, you know, carry on and, 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 you know, make some changes gradually. But the, the way that I've been, you know, to answer your question of being able to, to balance all of that, you know, with the situation that we're in is, first of all, I've got great staff. We've got incredible people that uh, we have working together with us, you know, Sister Gina as assistant pastor, Brother Ben, uh, more recently as assistant pastor, even though he's not full-time, yourself, Brother Greg, and then eventually also my wife working together and, and our ministry team together, uh, working uh, our ministers, 
um, it, it's it's really what's made it so much easier for me because I have a great relationship with all of you, with all of our team, and and everybody comes with, with such a great attitude and with such um, you know with their skills and the skill set, their particular talents that they add uh, to to create a a real wholeness, a robust ministry that really whenever there's any difficulty in our lives in my family or in my life um that i can always lean back on on our team and it literally it is it's not a one-man show it is it is a team effort and so i've been really um thankful that that we've been able to to develop that and god has blessed us i, I remember prior to you coming brother greg over from the states um you know we had uh, when we were like 20, 2007 2008 before you came, we were, um, you know, we had a lot of young men, young women in our church who were really faithful, the likes of Sister Stephanie, Sister Rachel, and we had a great group, but we didn't have any young men, and I was a little concerned about our future, mm -hmm. uh, and so we we prayed, and within a, a short window, you know, you came, Brother Greg Walmart came, Brother Jared, and others, you know, there was Keith, there was a bunch of you young men. Sam, were, Sam were, as were, well. Sam, Sam well. came, yeah. 2008, that's right. And all of you, you know, were at that age that were you're gifted, you're talented, and you're you have you know this desire to to serve the Lord, and so that's really what's um, helped us because that we've been I've been able to rely on that, but, but of course, uh, my own family, you know, we have my mother-in-law who's living with us, and she's become a very, uh, you know, close carer for Joaquin. She we never asked her, we never wanted her to do that, but she just naturally gravitated to looking after him. And that's really freed us, my wife and I, in ministry to be a lot more, um, I guess, available for people and with our time and including travel as well. And so uh, I have to give credit to, to, to my mother-in-law, my family, my mom and Ray. And uh, and I guess just, uh, again, one other thing I suppose that I could add to this is, is it like, as I said earlier, developing that, that rhythm um, that I had to be very careful not to get burnt out. And there have been moments, there have been times where I've just been so overwhelmed and bogged down, but I had to try and make sure that I don't take too much on, and and then just just to create a rhythm and making sure that my marriage is strong, Sister Robin and I, that that's our priority, uh, because if you know we're doing everything else well and then our marriage is falling apart, then then everything else is going to eventually fall apart, mm. and so kind of always prioritize uh, family uh, and marriage, and I've been able to prioritize that because I've got a great, great team and great family and friends that, that are working together with us for the kingdom of God. Hmm. Such a great answer. What drives you when it comes to ministry? What, what is, what drives you? What is your passion when it comes to ministry? Um, and I guess, you know, it, it's probably changed over the years. And, uh, you know, this is, that's a difficult question for me. And, and of course, um, I, I'm always drawn back to, to, Number one is is my relationship with God, it, it's my love for God. I, you know, I can't. And there's been times, of course, I'm only human, that it sometimes it's dwindled down to simply my duty for God, my obligation to to fulfill to to do a job. But when when it, if it remains like that, it gets quite miserable. It really, I I lose my joy, mm -hmm. I lose that sense of of excitement and zeal. But uh, I I. Take it back to the, the conversation that Jesus had with um, with Peter. And when Jesus asked him, you know, Peter, do you love me? Three times he asked him. And uh, three times he uh, Jesus replied to his answer from that question, feed my sheep. Hmm. And so um, the, the call of God to feed the sheep, to feed the flock of God, it's, it's, it's rooted in, it's based on our love for God. And so... For me, I guess that's what has to ultimately drive me. That's got to be at the very core, the engine, if you will, that drives the motor is, is that my relationship with God. And I'm not doing this for, for a pay packet at the end of the fortnight. I'm not doing this for some kind of fame or glory, but because I've just talked to Jesus every day and, and he's given me what, what he's passionate about. And the more I look into his word, the more I look into his eyes, into his face, if you will, the more that becomes a part of who I am. And, and so I guess, you know, it's a, it's a great question, Brother Greg, because I don't often think about this question anymore uh, because I, I, I always feel like this is, you know, this is what's driving me, moving me. And when we see things like somebody getting baptized, 
tears streaming down their face when we're giving them Bible study as they're hearing the word. That that's what fills me with joy. Mm. That's what gives me, you know, the, the, the excitement, the sense of fulfillment. And that's what keeps me going because if, if, if you're crying because you see somebody else crying, how must the heart of God feel? And, right. you know, and I've talked about this at length many for over many years is the fact that when I was young, young in the Lord, I didn't cry very much. You know, when I was getting in church, I was quite emotionally a bit uh, dull, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> but as I'm getting older and as I'm, I guess I'm getting closer to God as well over the years, I've been walking with him that that's become, you know, less of an issue for me. I, I start to, to feel more and cry a lot more and more naturally, I guess, mm. not putting it on, but, but yeah, uh, the heart of the love, my love for God, the love with all my heart, soul is what drives me. And then seeing people like you and I who were lost, like, like I was, like you were coming to God and, and, and seeing that. Amen. Uh, I know this is a bit of an aside, um, but you just briefly mentioning um, the tears reminded me of a powerful story of, uh, I think you told this before, a testimony. You said that when you first came to God, you, you would never cry, never. And uh, you'd see people weeping in the altar, and you're like, God, why, why don't I cry? And you, you said um, there was uh, something happened with the Philippines um, where yes. that, that testimony about, would you mind sharing that? Not at all. Yeah, that this is one of the, I guess, and I don't know, I forgot to talk about it earlier, but this is a, a key uh, a milestone or, or a key event in my life that's really changed me was I, after a couple of years um, being in church, I went back to the Philippines. I flew over for my grandfather's funeral. And while I was there, I visited the nearest uh, UPC church to, to my, uh, my grandfather's house. And it's kind of where I grew up when I was a kid before I left the Philippines. And uh, when I went into the church, it was just a small church and, you know, like cement floors and walls. It was very, very plain. And the, their pews were just literally just wooden benches. And, um, and when I, when, as soon as the song service started, I just, I just started crying. I just started bawling, like un, almost uncontrollably. I was almost embarrassed because in, in church, in Kamsi, you know, the, the spirit of God is powerful. I get excited and stirred, but. I'm not crying, you know, and I, cry, yeah. I would often think of sad, sad stories to make myself cry, you know, think about starving <laughs> kids in, in Africa and oh, Asia. Oh my goodness. I know, uh, just to make myself cry so that I would be more normal like everybody else, like, like my wife, she's just like a tap, just turns on and explodes. <laughs> but at this particular service in this church in, in the Philippines, I just started crying, crying, crying. And then, um, and you know, I didn't even know anybody there. I didn't even, I wasn't familiar. And, but then I came to find out when I spoke to the pastor at the end, he asked me who I was, my family name, and, and he goes, oh, is this your, your auntie? So, so I go, yeah. He goes, oh, I remember you. He said, she, your auntie was a member of this church. My aunt, my mom's oldest sister, who now lives in Canada, um, he said, she used to bring you here when you were just a little baby. You were just little, and we used to pray for you. Wow. And, um, and then I had these, then something, like I had these vague memories of going to a Sunday school where they gave us like ice blocks, you know, yeah. and that's why it made me remember it because it gave me excitement because, and I knew they don't do that in the, the other, the Catholic church I was going to, but I remember that's all I could remember. And, and it just dawned on me. It was a United, my aunt was a member of the United Pentecostal church of Australia and I'm wow. not Australia, <laughs> Philippines. <laughs> Philippines. And, and yeah. I never knew, I didn't have any inkling of that whatsoever, but somebody in my past when I was a kid was praying for me. Somebody who knew the truth, somebody who had a revelation of the one God. And my aunt would be, our, she was the lady that took care of us before we left the Philippines because my mother was working. My mother was in this, going to the city. It's like a one and a half hour drive. And, and my aunt would be with me and my sister the whole time. And she would, I remember, give us little Bible studies, little picture, you know, this picture Bibles. And as a kid, I remember she would show us the stories of hell, of people going oh into goodness. hell. And I remember, yeah, I'm like, I'm like five years old. And I'm like, I don't want to go there. I, you know, I was so scared of going to hell. But but they, those were seeds that were planted in my life. That even though I, I never went to Pentecostal Church uh, I, before coming to Belmore, in fact, I had gone to a, a U, UPC church, not just an, an apostolic church, but a UPC church when I was a little kid. And and it took all of that time and took me through all that journey for God to to bring me back. 
into a knowledge of him. And so, That's yeah, it, to me, it is an amazing story. I love that story. And I was trying to figure out if we could figure a way to get into this. And, <laughs> uh, I, I love that one. Every time you share it, I, I just, yeah, I love it. What excites yeah. you about the church in general in 2021? I, I think what really excited me this year was when we we opened up, you know, when we opened up the church that that I was scared. And of course, to be honest with you, there are some that didn't come back. But when we did open up, our, our services were we meet almost immediately. It was full. You know, we are having uh, great great attendances, and, and new people were coming. And and even throughout the the lockdown, and we're in a lockdown at the moment. But even throughout the lockdown last year, and of course, Australia was almost pretty much getting through last year unscathed as far as rates of infection was concerned. And so we, we were, for the most part, open. But even in the lockdowns, you know, people were still giving. We had the biggest year for our giving, and which shows to us that, that people still, it's one of the simplest sort of expressions of faith was that people still were committed to to giving to the things of God. Mm -hmm. I always felt that it would probably want to be the first things to go, but the opposite happened. God actually blessed us. And and so that's kind of what's encouraged me this year. And and the other thing I suppose is the adaptability of our of our church to to having to to get onto doing Zoom and online platforms to meet, but the willingness for our leaders and our church to be able to do that. I think that's what's really, you know, encouraged me and giving me, giving me hope. Mm. And that as we learn to roll with the punches, as we learn to adapt to circumstances, we know that this is not going to be forever. Uh, but there is also an excitement that's built up. And, and I'm really, I'm really looking forward to, to when, when this thing dies down, and, you know, whatever. And I'm, I don't want to talk about the situation with pandemic, but when we are fully open again, I am confident that there's going to be a great, great revival, a great move of God, because I mm. see this more as a lull in the storm. You know, before the storm, there's always a, a, a hush. There's always a quietness. There's always a lull. And, and I'm going to see this as a lull, and I'm going to do, do my our very best as a team to, to get an incredible move of God. Because, again, this is also a sign of the last days that we are nearing uh, closer to, to the second coming of Jesus. Man, What about the church in general? So that was more specific to the POS what excites you about the church in general, like say Australia, the region, uh, the world, the global church? What excites you about, say, the Pentecostal movement in 2021? Well, I think what what excites me is that um, you know the the church's readiness, uh, and we are getting a, an incredible amount of even in the last 12 months, an incredible amount of people uh, looking up our churches. They're wanting something real. They're wanting something that is is uh, tangible. They don't don't just want religion. And and what excites me is that uh, we're seeing people. We're starting works all over the place. We're seeing new churches starting up. We're seeing people stepping out in faith and um, going into new areas, going into new territories. And and we're continuing even despite the pandemic. We're continuing to see more and more souls hungry and thirsty for the things of God. Um, I'm excited to see even in, in our local, uh, in, within our area, within our region of Asia and the Pacific. Yeah, it's, you know, the pandemic is, is, is going through some of those areas. Like at the moment, Indonesia is experiencing uh, a terrible time with this, with the, with the coronavirus. It's spreading quite, I mean, in those countries, uh, the, the population is so congested. Mm. And we're seeing these, um, the infection rates going really high. But, but the church continues to grow and continues to multiply. And in fact, it's, it's causing more and more the unsaved to come and ask questions and they're receiving that. And so I guess a little bit of what we're experiencing in our local church, uh, we're sort of witnessing that um, externally in, in throughout Australia, throughout even in the Pacific and the region. Um, Samoa, for example, just have, had their, their general conference and there was many people received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and, and, and many there was a great attendance there. Yeah, I saw that. And, that, was, that was so exciting to see that. Yeah, actually, yeah, because you were there with me. Yeah, we went to Samoa a few years back together, and um, and Stephen Merritt, the the missionary there, I went to Bible school with him, so oh, it wow. was it was so uh, encouraging to to see that. This morning, I I hopped on Facebook and I saw that, and I was like, wow, that is, oh, that is so good. Really uh, encouraged me today. 
That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Me too. Well, this has been an awesome conversation. I'm sure our listeners have enjoyed it, getting to know you a bit more, if they didn't know you at all, uh, hearing your story. Uh, but I wanted to give you the opportunity as we, we wrap up here. Um, I've been sort of guiding the conversation a bit, um, telling you some of the things, asking you to talk about some of the things that, that I would have liked to to know and maybe some of our listeners would. But in conclusion, I want to give you the opportunity just to share a word with the listeners, uh, wh- whatever you feel uh, led to share, whatever God has laid on your heart. Amen. Well, thank you, Brother Greg. I appreciate, the, again, this this time, opportunity to, to share a little bit of my story. But I've been I've been on meditating on these last two verses, uh, these two verses in Second Timothy chapter one and six, and um, couldn't get away from this thought. And it says, "Wherefore I put you in remembrance." This is Paul writing to Timothy that you stir up the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. So he's referring to to the gift of the Holy Spirit, and he says, "For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind." And I couldn't help but thinking just how, with all this happening at the moment and the way that you know mainstream media is is um, putting things, and of course, um, you know it's easy for us to just ignore it. But sometimes I feel like fear can sort of trickle through our spirits, through our minds, just from from sound bites, from from reading headlines, from things that we hear on the media on the mainstream, and it has a way of just trickling in to accumulate a sense of fear and panic in the hearts of, of our people. And and, and we, while it wasn't so bad last year in that, you know, we were able uh, to control the, the infection here, and in recent years, in recent weeks, this last couple of weeks, I feel like that, that, you know, fear has been sort of trickling down in the hearts of our people. And and I just, I want to remind us that, that we, out, out of anybody in this world, we are to be the most courageous and bold, that we are not to fear sickness. That even if sickness does come for some people, it's not something to be feared because we know that God is with us. He has not given us the spirit of fear, but of the power and of love and of sound mind. And, and that we are to stir that up, to stir up that spirit of power and that sense of love and that, that sense of our mind. Because our emotions are very fickle and they can lie to us. They can, they can give us a bad day. They can just, you can pull the very heart and soul out of us and, and cause us to, to walk around in, with a cloud and in darkness. But I want to encourage everybody that's listening to this, that if you've got the spirit of God in you, Paul actually tells us to stir it up, to, to awaken something, to, to move, that, that something would begin to move and that God, that we would, we would put God as a word to the test without tempting God. Of course, the Bible says we cannot tempt God, but, but to say, God, do something, let your power be released. Let, let your love just be saturated in my heart that it would flow out of me. And, and let, let my mind, let, let it not be ripped into pieces by, by what we see on the media, but let my mind be at peace, complete peace, as, as I meditate upon your word. And so I, I just, you know, just a simple thought, um, which is to say, to, to stir up the gift of God that is within you and, and do not fear but let us be the people that are holding the, the, the banner of truth and courage and let the people see that God is with us, that God is in the church. I don't know about you, but I left that conversation inspired. I have always been struck by the humility of my pastor and how he easily relates to people despite being in the ministry for a number of decades now and being a leader of the movement in the Asia-Pacific region. If this blessed you, please share it with a friend and encourage them to follow the podcast. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and a number of other platforms. Just search the Hacker Podcast and you should find us. We have a bunch of content that we have been working on during this lockdown, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you all. If you have time to rate and review the show, where you listen to it, I would greatly appreciate that. Thank you again for your time today, and we look forward to seeing you next time on the Hacker Podcast.